Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Story Recipe Workshop. Uh, I hope you all have been having as fun a time at this conference as I have been having. Uh, I am blown away by what we're doing here. Uh, I go to one of these presentations after another, and I'm learning so much uh, about things that I thought I knew about, as well as things that I have never known anything about. Uh, so it, it's been terrific. Um, we're going to do something I think a little unique here in that I want to do kind of a speed workshop. Actually, try to make some fixes in your story right now. To do that, you probably want to download the story rescue worksheet. And let me give you, you can do it on your phone, we just give you that, that URL. It's www.truby.com forward slash rescue. Truby.com forward slash rescue. And all the screens that we're going to go through will be there on your phone, and you can actually input and, and make some fixes, hopefully, in your story right now. When stories have problems, I've found that at least 90% of the time, the cause can be found in the structural setup of the story. What that means is that the key is to identify and fix those structural problems right at the beginning. In other words, before you write the full novel. Because when you write that novel, those structural problems are going to be embedded in that novel, and they're very hard to dig out. Now, I want to tell you a dirty little secret, not just about writing novels, but about, about writing any story in any movie. This is somebody, something nobody wants to talk about. For most writers, their second draft is worse than their first. So if you've ever had that problem, look around. We've all had that problem. That is the norm. Now, obviously, that runs counter to the idea that writing is rewriting. I, we, we've all heard that said, and it's true to a point. So why then is that second draft worse than the first, the third worse than the second a lot of time? Well, a couple of reasons. First of all, rewriting is a skill. It's a skill like character, plot, symbol, theme. And most writers have never learned the skill of rewriting. There is a way to rewrite so that it actually improves the story instead of makes it, making it worse. But there's a second reason that I just alluded to, which is that when you write a story into its final form, meaning the full novel, it's like hardening of cement in your mind. And those deep structural elements that the whole story is based on are then hidden. And if you've made mistakes, they're so deep down and they're so hardened in your mind that it's really hard for you to dig deep and make those structural fixes. Not to mention the fact that you're not going to have to rewrite the entire, entire novel. That doesn't make sense. There's another reason why getting the structural setup right is so important. And that has to do with one of the main strategies that people talk about here at 20 Books all the time, which is that you're building your brand. And that means that you need to write series, that you need to release those books fairly rapidly, to the degree that sometimes you're writing a book a month. My, my friends in traditional publishing, they hear that and they say, well, are you out of your mind? And that's not possible. Well, it is possible. It is possible, and it must be done for all kinds of marketing reasons. And that's why that makes an even greater premium for you to 
figure out the structural setup of that story right away. Get it right the first time and do it fast. So I want to go through seven techniques that I think are the most important I know for allowing you to do that. And what I want to do then is we'll just have for each technique, we'll take, a, take two minutes and you can write down what, you know, what, how that applies to your story. And then I'm hoping you will have plenty of time for questions and time for those of you who would like to read what you put down for your story at, at the microphone and maybe I can give you some feedback and we can all be part of that process for how do we work through these structural elements to get them right the first time. Technique number one comes right at the premise line. Very first step of the story. Your hero is an underdog who must overcome extreme odds. Now why? Why is that important? First of all, readers root for the underdog. So if you have this element, you can get reader identification and you get it really fast. It's one of the fastest ways to get reader identification. The second reason is the greater the odds against the character, the greater success when they actually get it done. Now there's a test that you can use to make sure this is in your story. Does your hero have a disadvantage that makes him uniquely unsuited to being successful in this particular fight. Now, we don't want this character to be super successful from day one. No, because that's what they're going to get to at the end. And so the fix to do this in your story is, besides giving your hero the strongest opposition possible, Give him a personal quality or weakness at the beginning of the story that makes it even harder for him to win. Now, why is this so important? This actually goes to one of the keys of great story in every meeting. And that is you always want to give your hero both an internal and an external bond. Internal and external. Sometimes I'll talk to a writer and I'll say, well, who's, who's your hero's opponent? And they'll say, my hero's opponent is himself. And they look at me with a big smile like, it's really cool, isn't it? <laughs> and I say, yes, it is really cool. But you just described your weakness of the character. You also need an external opponent that he can fight against. Otherwise, there's no dramatic comfort. So we need both. Now, let's look at a classic example of this first technique, Harry Potter. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. In that book, Harry is 11 years old, and he's going up against the most powerful wizard in history. That's what I would call being an underdog. That's what I would call extreme odds. And it's interesting to know, those of you who like to read Harry Potter for other than just it's a really fun set of books to read, it's interesting to know what the writer, J.K. Rowling, had to do to keep that seven book series from ending in the first 30 pages of the first book. If this is an 11-year-old kid going up against the greatest wizard in history, why doesn't he just die, you know, like that? But I, I, I can't say the opponent's name because I will be destroyed. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about, right? And so she had to do a number of things to weaken the main opponent that will allow Harry to get in the game and survive long enough to gain the power to fight him. But what about his weaknesses? Well, he's completely untrained. He lacks confidence, and he's afraid as well he should be. 
So, let's take a couple of minutes and put down what is the added weakness you're going to give to your hero that will hold him or her back from being successful in your goal. Take a couple of minutes. Now this, this is like speed chess. We're going to be able to change all of this stuff. This is not written in stone. But go ahead and put that down along with how is your hero an underdog? Go ahead. Technique two, give your hero a specific goal. I cannot overemphasize the importance of this technique. Why is this so important? If the goal is not specific, the story will have no spine. The entire plot comes off of this. So we've got to have a specific goal. Now, what is the test to know whether you've got this right? <coughs> Ask yourself, is there a moment near the end of the story when the reader knows for sure whether the hero either succeeded in getting the goal or failed? And sometimes they fail. Is there a moment when the hero, when the reader knows that the hero succeeded or failed in getting the goal. It must be a specific moment. Now what's the fix here? In a scene near the beginning of the story, have your hero state exactly what he wants. There's a lot of different words for want, but come out and say it, because when they have to say it, it means they're going to be a bit more specific, and your reader is going to understand what that goal is. They're not going to say, aha, that's the goal. No. But they've read enough stories to know, ah, that's what this story, that's the track we're going down on this story. Let me give you a classic example, Lord of the Rings. There's a scene, of course this is a trilogy, you know, this epic storytelling. So, at the beginning, it's not at the beginning of the movie, but it's near the, the first third of the first film. Frodo volunteers to take the ring to the fires of Mount Doom. And he says, I will take the ring. That is the moment. So again, let's take a couple of minutes. Pardon? The next page. Ah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Is there, what is the scene at the beginning when your hero is going to state 
his or her goal? And is there a certain dialogue that you might use? Now again, this dialogue is not written in stone. And you may, in your story, not use dialogue to state the goal at all. Many stories, they don't come right out and say it. For example, a romance novel. It's rare that the person will come right out and say it. So how do we know what it is? It's in the gaze. I want that person. I'm not struck. And so we don't have to say it. But there will be a scene, a moment near the beginning, when that event happens. So go ahead and take a minute. And remember to ask yourself, is there a specific moment when the reader knows when the hero has succeeded or failed? I can tell you that most writers, and I mean this, most writers, when they come up with their goal, it is not specific enough. Technique number three. <coughs> Give your hero the most intense desire possible. Give your hero the most intense desire possible. Why is this important? The more the hero wants to go, the more the reader wants her to get the goal. This is another way that we get that intense reader identification with the hero. If the hero thinks, you know, I really like that, but, you know, I mean, if I don't get it, no big deal. Is the reader going to be on for the ride? Of course not. I like the metaphor of the train. In a story, the story doesn't get going until the desire line kicks in. And when that happens, and the hero gets a goal, it's like everybody, in, all the readers, jump on the train with the, with the hero, and we go after the goal together. So the more we want that goal, the more the reader is going to want this thing to win, this, this character to win. Now, this is also important, this intense desire is also important because it's what gives your hero a moral test in the story. And that always makes for a stronger story. A moral test. And that test is, how far is she willing to go to get her goal? And here's the fix. Have her take actions to win the goal. She would have never thought possible at the beginning of the story.
You're putting your hero under pressure. The more pressure you put her under, the more engaging it is for the reader. Because now, what's at stake isn't just the goal, it's her moral in, in, intestitude. Like <laughs> Fortitude, but with Fortitude, intestinal, that's what I can do. <laughs> I like intestinal too. Right? Yeah. Maybe we should have that word. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That moral intestinal though. Yeah. <laughs> when we involve the characters, not just the characters' psychology, but their morality, the story is much more profound. Let me give you an example. <coughs> Hunger Games. This fight has life or death stakes. And she is willing to kill in order to win this game and to survive. But will she do anything to survive and win? No. She draws the line with certain people that she cares about. And of course, the key to the end of the first book is she says, no, I will not go that far. Kill me if you want. I'm not going to kill you. And it flips not only that situation, it, it flips that entire world. Now the whole premise of the game is shot. That's how important this element is in great storytelling. Take a very different example from a different medium, The Dark Knight. Batman is willing to do anything to fight crime and win justice. And especially when confronted with an opponent as serious as the Joker. Except, what is the one thing he will not do? What is the line he will not cross? Yeah. He will not kill. I will not, I'll do anything, but I will not murder. That's what you want to do with your hero. Push her all the way to the edge <coughs> so that you are testing just how far she will go to get this goal. Let's take a couple of minutes. Put down the actions she takes to demonstrate that she is serious about getting this goal. And the reason we know this is different from when she started the story. Remember, at the beginning of the story, she has not faced these kind of tests. But this is going to take her into extraordinary circumstances. Take a couple minutes. Checking four. Your hero should have one main opponent throughout the story. One main opponent. Why? This focuses focuses the structure. It builds the conflict throughout the middle, and it increases the plot. 
So this one is big. So the test is, is there one character who is your hero's nemesis? Now what does that mean structurally, nemesis? Opponent is often misunderstood by writers. The thing of the opponent is the villain, the bad guy. No. But there is a structural definition to the opponent that makes all the difference in the world. The opponent is anyone who wants to prevent the hero from reaching her goal. That and that alone is the definition of an opponent. And so the fix is ask yourself, who is most determined to stop my hero from reaching her goal? And why? The mistake I often see is there's an obvious character who is the, the, the writer's main opponent. But when you look at, well, why? I mean, other than the fact that they're just, you know, the most powerful person in the world and they want to destroy the, the fantasy hero and so on and so forth. Why? What do they have to do with this character and their goal? They must be intimately connected. Main opponent, in Harry Potter. Voldemort. There, I said it. <laughs> no, it's gutsy. It's very gutsy, buddy. I'm not sure where the attack is going to come from. I'm ready for it. Hunger Games, Pres President Snow, Lord of the Rings, Saruman. Take a couple of minutes, put down your hero's nemesis, and how will he try to stop the hero from getting the goal? There should be at least two other characters who strongly oppose the hero as well. And the test here is, do they also want to prevent the hero from getting her goal? It always comes down to that. Notice how we're tying together desire and hope. Always tying them together. And the fix is, try to introduce at least two other opponents, but hide how they're connected to the main opponent. This is a big one right here. Why is this so valuable? The more opponents you have, the more plot you have. And if you hide how the opponents are connected, it makes them more difficult to defeat. And again, you get more plot because you get more reveals. When we find out how they are connected as the story unfolds. So what about Hunger Games? Well, obviously the other fighters in the arena, those are the main other opponents. Seneca is another opponent besides the main opponent. And Harry Potter. We've got his aunt and uncle, Draco Malfoy, Mr. Filch, 
in the first book, Professor Correll. And as I recall, whoever is the, the new professor of the dark arts, is that person always a bad guy? Did they never get it that who's ever the new professor of the dark arts is trouble? And of course, the key to the entire series, what character? Snake. Who appears to be the opponent. We find out, no, he's a friend. But then we think, no, he's not a friend. He's the opponent. He goes back and forth for seven years. It's the key to the entire poem. <coughs> so, put down the other two opponents. And I say at least two other opponents. There can be more. <coughs> techniques have to do with genre. Genres are platforms. And the way they work is that they take the seven major structure steps that we find in all stories, no matter how old, how new, no matter what genre they are, but they take those seven steps and they twist them in a unique way. They execute them in a unique way. So technique six is Base your story on a mix of two to three genres. Why? Almost all popular novels, and I could include popular films, etc., etc. This is key to the entertainment business worldwide. It's certainly true in novels. Most all the popular novels are a combination of two, three, even four genres. Now there is a big marketing value to that. But the main story value to it is that this radically increases your plot. That's the old marketing technique of give them two for the price of one. But now you give them two, three, sometimes four for the price of one. And boy, they love it. So the test here is, does your story idea, because genres are implied in the story idea itself, in, in the premise, does the story idea suggest two or three genres that you can use to tell this story? Let me give you some examples. Harry Potter. Part of the reason for its immense success is that this is not a single genre story. This is a combination of fantasy, myth, horror, and coming-of-age English schoolboy. Yes, that is an actual genre. It goes back a long way in English storytelling. Tom Brown's school days, goodbye Mr. Chips, and so on. So she was pulling from a very popular English source, but she makes all four of these together. Hunger Games is a combination of myth, science fiction, and action. Lord of the Rings is a combination of myth, fantasy, and action. So put down the two or three genres that you think might be involved in your story. By the way, if you say, well, mine only has one, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, don't, don't worry about that. But if you see others, pull them in. Use them to your benefit. And technique seven is this. While popular stories usually mix two to three genres, you always want to make one genre your primary story form. So 
So the test is, is there one genre that is clearly the most important one in your story? <laughs> and the fix here is, choose only one genre to provide the spine of the story. That's why we use this technique. We have to have a single spine. Then, take whatever story beats from the other genres that are useful, that work with the spine, and add them in. If they don't, leave them out. That's how you combine techniques six and seven. Because they look like they're contradictory, but they're not. reason this is so important that you have this primary genre is that if you don't, you will get story chaos. You'll have beats from all these different forms and there will be no organization of the story at all. <coughs> so in Harry Potter, the main genre is fantasy. In other games, the main genre is myth. In Lord of the Rings, the main genre is myth. <coughs> Now, I realize we don't have all the time. <clears throat> However, if you have, if you like to read your what you put down, and I realize a lot of you don't want to put it out there and make it public, that's fine. Well, I, I am almost certain that nobody here is going to steal your idea. <laughs> but if you want to read what you've written and I can give you some feedback, that's fine. We can also be happy to give you some feedback afterwards. Or if you have any story question about either your story or about story in general, come on up and ask the question. Um, I was hoping you could talk a bit about the opponent in a mystery because obviously the opponent's hidden. Right. Mm -hmm. That is a great subject and a big subject. Let me give you just a couple things about that. First of all, the, the opponents are all the suspects. All of them are opponents. Obviously, the main opponent is the person who actually committed the crime. But we're going to hide that. And that gives us the greatest difficulty in writing a mystery. Is that we take one of the seven major structure steps by which all stories move, and we hide it until the very end. So how does the story proceed? Proceed by solving a mystery. The mystery takes the place of where we normally introduce the opponent. Now, mysteries have the most complex plot of any genre form. And that's why they are so difficult to write. And People who look down their nose on mystery, uh, I'm sorry, you are ignorant. <laughs> because these things are really tough to do. And you see, these writers on television do one a week. These people, to me, are gods. That's how tough that is. So here's, here's what I think is one of the most, if not the most technique, most important technique in writing detective mystery stories, which is begin with the detectives, excuse me, begin with the opponent's plan. Put yourself in the mind of the killer. And it's all about coming up with a plan, not just for killing the person, but for hiding it. Because that's what the detective is going to have to uncover. So you want to come up with an ingenious plan from the point of view of the killer, because the entire story will revolve around that. And the quality of your story is based on how ingenious that plan is. This, by the way, is, let me just extend this principle a little far, to all storytelling. The key to plot is begin with the opponent. What is the opponent trying to do? What plan will they come up with to make it impossible for the hero to get his goal? If you start from that position, your plot will be 10 times better than if you don't. Next question. 
Hi, um, I'm curious to hear about series arcs, particularly in um, romance where you have, might have five or six standalone set in the same world. How can you help propel, propel readers through the story aside from just the fact that they love the world and they love your writing? Well, those are two of the most important reasons. Now, the, the, the contradiction is, in, is inherent in your question, which is, if we've got a standalone and it's a series, what does that mean? It means structurally, the standalone hits all seven steps. It's a complete story, including that self-revelation that both lovers have, that I'm in love with this person and I'm going to sacrifice to be with them. That's, that's the ultimate self-revelation at the end that both characters have. It's a, the technique is called a double reversal, where both characters learn. And they learn through the other. So then the question is, well then how do you set up a series? Well, then it's up to you. Are you talking about the same two characters? In each story, standalone story? No, it would be different couples in each different, story. Different couples. Then then what you're doing is you're doing what we would normally call in television, for example, a, an anthology structure where you've got these separate standalone stories. They're all in the same world. For example, there's a, a recent one on Netflix based on the modern love New York Times. And these are separate love stories with separate characters in the same New York City world. And at the end of the last one, in, in the season one, we see them, they're not aware of each other, but we see how they're walking in the same neighborhood. So, but it, for that kind of situation, it is primarily done within the, within that story world. However, I strongly recommend that you have at least incidental ways that the couples will run into or deflect off of each other, partly knowing and not knowing. Because then when they're not know, when they have these deflections not knowing, that's where the reader goes, oh, I see it and they don't. It makes them feel very special. Right. Do you have any recommendations on um, books or other resources that might be helpful to delve further into that? I want to know the expert's favorites. <laughs> uh, to learn tons of other techniques for writing great and popular novels, check out my Story for Novelist course. Uh, as you can see, this is not what I'm good at. Uh, Trivia.com forward slash 20 books novels and you will get a 20% discount if you go here. Uh, it, is, it is a four module course that's extensive. It covers so many techniques. It, it, uh, it does not go into in particular, it doesn't go into particular genres. Um, if you go to my website, I have a number of courses in the different genres. Um, it, it, genres are the key to popular story today, especially in novels. And that's one reason why I'm here, is because all of the emphasis that I've seen placed on genres here, I was just in a cozy mysteries one. Excellent panel. You know, this is where the game is won or lost. You've got to win the genre game. So you've got to become, whatever your genre is, you've got to become the best at it. Talk to me afterwards and I'll tell you some of my favorites. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. So I was uh, diagnosing one of my current stories and looking at it and it appears that my character has a goal that's pretty primal, but I don't know if it quite fits as a goal because his goal is survival. And that seems more of trying to not have something happen than to happen. So is that something that is generally sufficient or would you uh, recommend a positive goal. I would recommend a positive goal. You can have survival as the goal. Survival is the lowest goal possible in the story. And while it's very real and it's very specific, you can't build from that. So anything you can do to get a more positive goal that will make an active hero instead of a reactive hero, that's the other problem with survival goal, it's a reactive hero. That's why survival is the goal in more stories. Is considered the lowest of all challenges. So a more positive goal could that be learning about things or be more like 
things that are larger than himself, such as saving the community. Exactly. Okay. Saving something, doing something that will require active steps, and preferably one that is not totally self saving Thank you. Just a quick announcement, our session is technically over, so if you need to be somewhere now, feel free to go. I don't mind if we run over a bit, if that's okay with you. Happy to keep going. Uh, thank you for continuing. Um, so, I was wondering if the, the opponent um, has to be explicitly stated, or if they can find out who the opponent really was at the end of the novel. Many stories, the opponent is not explicitly stated, and in fact is hidden away, and is somebody who we think is the friend. Okay. I, I, call, I call this character the fake ally. Also known, you're probably more familiar with the term frenemy. Right? Someone who appears to be, to appear to be the friend, but is really an enemy. Now, when you do that, though, and you put, have your main opponent is this character, who appears to be the friend. What you need to do is substitute a character who we think is the main opponent, who can, who can you can support that function over the course of the story until the very end when we find out the real main opponent was this person. But since that's going to happen only at the very end or near the end, we need somebody to take over that opponent role for the rest of the story. Okay. Great ideas. Thank you. Hi. My question is about the design line. Can you change in the course of uh, the novel. For example, uh, the hero thinks he must uh, rescue someone, then discovers that in fact this person is uh, dangerous. So it's an uh, objective change. Is, is that okay? It's very tricky. You, let me tell you, usually the answer is no, because this is the spine. So if you change the main desire line of the character, say halfway through, it's going to give the appearance of two stories that you've stuck together. Now, there are rare occasions when this occurs. Uh, to give you an example, Avatar. Uh, the reason it works and the reason it's a rare uh, example is that he begins on one side and therefore is given a goal by the, the main opponent on, uh, of his tribe, right? But then in somewhere in the middle, he shifts over to the other side, and the people who were his opponent are now his allies. And the people who were his allies are now his opponent. So then you have to come up with a second opponent there. If you do what you just suggested, you need to carry that desire all the way till the end and only find out that they were wrong at the very end. And that's the moment when they discover not only is this person not worth rescuing me? This person has been my main opponent all along. If you do it that way, it's really cool. Thank you. Hello, this goes to your second point of a character having a goal. They have both internal and external goals that you, well, not you, but that need to be identified by the reader. And while external goals are easy to identify, internal goals are less so. Can you provide a good example of how we should be able to do this? Let me just play with the terminology a little bit. And I know some people use the internal goal idea. I don't personally because this idea of internal goal is not a, a conscious goal. It's very important that it not be something that the character is aware of. That's why I use the term weakness of being, the first of the seven major structure steps. This is the great flaw in the character Something is missing in that character, and it's so serious that it's ruining her life. Okay, so overcoming that flaw is that. That is the what you would term you would use as the internal goal. Their their need. I simply use the word need. Their need is to overcome that flaw by the end of the story. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hi, um, thank you for doing this. Um, I'm a little bit confused as to technique three. Um, you talked about um, the Dark Knight, and uh, I don't remember the other example, but um, Hunger Games, where you said, um, how far is he or she willing to go to get her goal? And 
I don't, I don't quite understand this text saying have have her take actions to win the goal. She never, she would never have thought possible at the beginning of the story. Um, for sure, all the way to the edge. Um, I'm gonna, um, so is this more about the line that they're not willing to cross, or yes, so you got, I'm, it's exactly. And then this is why. And by the way. This technique that I mentioned that you just repeated there, one of the most difficult techniques in story. So it's, it's a difficult thing to wrap your mind around, but it's basically what happens is, as the hero is taking action steps to reach her goal, in the early and middle part of the story, she will be losing to the main opponent, because at that point in the story, the main opponent is too strong. What happens then is that the hero becomes desperate, and they start to be push toward immoral actions in order to get the goal. And then the ally says to them, wait a minute, I'm trying to help you get this goal, but you're starting to take actions that are wrong. You've got to stop. The hero is not ready to listen to that at this point. And that's why what we're constantly doing is we're putting the hero in a moral vice. We're tightening the vice each time. And one of the most interesting uh, examples that I would suggest that you look at is take a look at the plot of the Dark Knight. The plot of the Dark Knight is simply a set of steps that the Joker forces Batman to step through. Each one is morally more challenging than the one before. So he's tightening the vice each time. Is he, is Batman actually doing things that he never thought he would do in those, at the, at, you said at the beginning of this, I can understand making a hero do something that they never thought they would do like at the end, but you said to do it at the beginning. Um, am I just reading that too literally? A little bit, yeah. Okay. What, what we're talking about there is, see at the, at the beginning of the story also, the hero is not that conscious of themselves. They've never been put in this kind of moral test. In the case of Batman, yeah, he's seen a lot of nasty people and he's had to do a lot of nasty things, which you did in the previous episode, right? But what, what the, the Joker is forcing him to do is deal with moral situations and moral problems that become impossible predicaments. There is no right answer, right? There is going to be negative fallout no matter which choice you make. And of course, the key scene there is he is interrogating the Joker. He locks the door because he's about to do something illegal, basically beat up the suspect in the interrogation room to get this information. And then he goes even further at the end where, where he, he um, what's the word, what's the word? He, he takes each person, everybody's phone in the city, and he, 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 Uses it as that whole location. Yeah, surveillance. He, he, you know, that's incredibly illegal, right? But he says that in order to catch this guy, it's got to be done. And would you say that this is, was this technique put in something like Star Wars? Is this like very consistent and I'm not okay. seeing it? Or? And now we're getting into some really interesting qualifiers here. When you have stories where we have the good guy, the classic good guy, there's much less, or we're going to put them under moral, much less moral pressure. When we have characters who are typically children, the younger the child, the less moral test there will be. So, for example, uh, uh, if you have a hero like Harry Potter at 11 years old, we're not putting him under a moral test. We're going to put him under psychological test, but not moral test. And so if you have this kind of classic hero, Type, then you're going to have much less of this, but then the complexity of the story will be much less as well. So, and this is the last thing I'll say is, um, so you're saying that the more your story is intended for adults, the more useful this technique is. That's right. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So my question is about um, opponents. You know, as you're going through this, I was thinking about my story. I realize it's fancy. I realize there is a big um, mystery in the story itself, but it's kind of underlying. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm thinking about the opponent, my opponent, so one of the mis well, that big mystery is who the main character really is, her origin. The opponent um, has the wrong idea of who she is. 
he thinks that he can use her to bring down somebody else. And so he is setting her up for things that are going to keep her from her main goal, but it might not be obvious. And I'm wondering, you know, having this opponent, and it's going to be clear in the story that the opponent is trying to use her to get somebody else, does that weaken my story? I mean, eventually they'll find out who she really is and that what the opponent was thinking was wrong. Um, and she is going to be one of the more powerful people to basically undermine the opponent's plan. But I here's, just, here's, 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 what you just described is very dangerous. <laughs> Because what you, what you described is you're very close to making the opponent the main character. You are not concerned with how is the hero preventing the opponent from getting his goal. Yes, she should do that. But, but that's not the real key. The real key is what is her goal and how does the opponent stop her. He may be trying to stop her for all kinds of wrong reasons. He may not know who she really is. That's fine. But you have to have very good reasons why this opponent is trying to stop the hero from getting that hero. And, and, that's the, and that's the person who is going to drive the story. And that's why you want to give that goal to your hero and not the main goal to the opponent. Okay, so I can still keep him in, just make her um, much more that he is trying to stop her goal much more clear and not go into yes. as much. Yes, and you can have him. him discover that when he finds out who she really is, make sure that that makes him even more determined to stop her from getting her goal. Right? Not less. It's like, yes. oh, well, if that's the case, then I don't have to worry about this person. No, you want him to say, oh my God, I, I thought it was bad before, but this is, this is disaster. Yes. Okay? okay? Good. Thank you. My question is also about the um, opponent. Um, you mentioned that there's a main opponent, but then there's also secondary opponents, and that there, I wasn't clear how important the relationship between the two of them is, if there absolutely has to be one. No, there does not have to be one. What, I say, what, I, what I'm saying is consider it. Look for ways that they may be connected under the surface. There's plenty of really good stories where they're not. You know, the main thing is that you have other opponents besides the main opponent who can be attacking the hero at different times because that's, this intensifies the plot. If you can get this hidden connection, it'll increase your plot. But if you have at least three opponents, you'll have plenty of plot just from them. Thank you. Okay? Another opponent question. Uh, can one of your opponents be nature or your setting? For yes. example, the Martian. Yeah, absolutely. But realize that nature is an opponent. I mentioned that survival is the lowest of all desire opponents. Nature is the lowest of all possible opponents. Because you're, you're essentially talking about a force of nature. And you can play with, well, first there's a volcano, and then there's a, an earthquake, and then there's a big windstorm, and so on and so forth. But those may be different on the surface, but it's the same beat. It's the same attack. And so, again, like the problem with survival as a desire line, it's hard to build the story that way. And that's why you can have nature as an opponent, and it can be a very powerful opponent, but it's more important to have your main opponent be human. Human. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hold up. Yep, we're done. Okay. Thanks. 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 Thanks.